Hello everyone, this is Ramsey from the Concourse Podcast. If you enjoy listening to this podcast, just like I do, it means that, like me, you guys love history, and specifically, the history of warfare and conquest, as Timur is most renowned for his great and vast conquests. If so, check out my podcast, where I will cover, chronologically, the greatest conquerors in history, including the famous ones like Alexander the Great and Timur, and the lesser known ones, like Sargon the Great, the world's first great conqueror, and Subutai, the guy actually responsible for a great part of the Mongol conquests. Now, back to you, James. I want you to think of one of your close friends. Not a romantic partner or family member, but a good friend. Somebody who you've known for several years, and somebody who you've shared your fair amount of struggles with. Maybe there were scenarios or situations in your past when you came up against something difficult, and when other people took their distance from you, this person was there for you and helped pull you through. You may not have made it through without them. You have this history of camaraderie with this person. They've become like a brother or sister to you. Now, imagine this. Imagine that you and this friend of yours are trying to achieve the same accomplishment, right? Okay, but here's the catch. There are two catches, actually. First of all, only one of you can succeed. Maybe it's a romantic partner you've both fallen for, maybe it's this corporate or political position. Whatever the case, only one of you will get it and the other person will fail. And here's the second catch. You can only achieve this goal if you work together. Now, that's a bit of an interesting dynamic, but let's complicate this scenario even more. Let's say that if you're the loser in this little setup we've got going, you lose everything. So my question for you is this. Think of this friend, this person you've known for years, right? How much would it take for you to betray them? As you might say, I would never betray them, or this scenario would never happen. And you're probably right. But let's say that this scenario has happened and is inescapable. How do you proceed? Who betrays the other person first? Now, hopefully you'll never find yourself in such a scenario, but this is exactly where we find Timur and Hussein in the 1360s. Over the past five episodes or so, the story of Timur has been the story of Timur and Hussein. Their stories, their journeys can't be separated. And what began as a practical and strategic alliance quickly transformed into something more. The two men became friends. After all, how could they not? We've all been in situations like this. You're paired with somebody you don't really know for a group project or a presentation or a job or something. And maybe you don't really like them. Maybe they're kind of annoying. But then because of the difficult situation, the job, whatever it is, because you have to work together to succeed, you come out thinking, maybe they weren't so bad after all. In fact, maybe I kind of like having them around. Well, imagine how you would feel if you had to fight alongside this person in a battle. Imagine how you'd feel after several battles. I'd imagine you would become friends with this person no matter who they were after that. And Timur and Hussein have been through hell together. They've been forced to flee their homes. Together. They've been outlaws and refugees. Together. They've fought in how many battles? They've been imprisoned. They've fled defeats together. They've shared the spoils of war together. They've even personally saved each other's lives on several occasions. And on top of all that, Timur married Hussein's sister, the Princess Aljai, making the two men legal brothers in addition to the camaraderie they already no doubt felt. But here's the thing. That fictional scenario I brought up earlier for you and your friend it was not fiction for Timur and Hussein. Both men wanted to rule. Both men wanted to be the emir of Transoxiana, but because neither was strong enough to seize this, they needed one another in order to stand a chance. But they also no doubt knew that should one of them actually succeed, the other would lose everything, including probably his life. How much does it take for one of these men to betray the other? Who breaks the bonds of brotherhood first? So as we progress through this episode and the next episode, I want you and I to remember that Timur and Hussein aren't just some names from some dusty book I found. They were real men, friends, and brothers. And we know how their relationship begins. Friends, brothers, comrades in arms, as we discussed. And likely, even if you don't know how it ends, you could probably figure it out. I think I said this before, but Timur's empire is called the Timurid Empire, and not the Timurid and Husseinian Empire. No, Hussein is no longer in the picture. He loses. He loses everything. 
So we know how it begins and we know how it ends, but the most interesting part of this, this part of Timur's story is the transition from the beginning to the end of Timur and Hussein's relationship. And on today's episode, we delve into this. Hello and welcome to the Timmer Podcast, a show where you and I investigate the life, conquests, character, and legacy of Amir Timur. When we last left off, we saw that the Mughals, led by their Ilyas Khan, invaded Transoxiana, crushed Timur and Hussein at the Battle of the Mire or the Battle of the Rains, and then proceeded to lay siege to the city of Samarkand. But then, with this odd turn of events, the people of Samarkand rose up, led by a group of inspiration, inspirational people who could talk, inspirational religious and political speakers, possibly Sarbadars, possibly just locals, but the people of Samarkand rose up, they barricaded their city, took up arms, and with the help of a horse plague, defeated the Mughals and drove them off. But while the siege of Samarkand was underway, Timur and Hussein weren't present. No, they were fleeing for their very lives, because in their mind, Samarkand was lost, Mawarnar was lost, and they were probably thinking that the next checkmark on the problems to fix list of the Mughals was them. So they fled. Hussein fled south with, with his contingent of the surviving army. The south was where his small Afghan kingdom was, where he could find some amount of safety, maybe build up his forces a bit more in preparation. One of our sources claims that Hussein was a coward in hoping to soon cross down into India where he would escape. But I find this a bit out of character for him. After all, this was his kingdom. These were his people. He was the grandson of Amir Kazagan. If he couldn't rule here, he wouldn't be able to rule anywhere else. And in addition, Hussein had defended these lands against the Mughals years before. He had lost, but Yazdig claims that Hussein intended to defend these lands and his people again to the death. And I think that's more in character of who he was. As for Timur, we're told that he fled to his home city of Kesh and set about making defensive preparations. But soon enough, he realized that this was a hopeless endeavor, especially if Hussein was fleeing so far to the south. Thus, Timur decided that flight was his only path to survival. After all, once Samarkand falls, and it surely will fall, the Mughals will proceed to chase him down. So Timur gets every soldier, every man, woman, and child who will follow him, as much of his tribe, the Barlas tribe, as many of his allies, he gets them together and they flee. They cross the Amu Darya and leave Mawarnar, leave their homes, leave many of their friends and family to the swords and arrows of the Mughals. While fleeing, Timur and Hussein had left scouts and spies behind to inform them of the actions of the Mughals, what's going on, not that they had any hope that things would somehow turn around, but instead to keep them up to date on the invasion so that they would know how much time do we have before the Mughal armies come riding down to the south to catch us. So when messengers arrive from Samarkand after weeks of siege, you can bet that Timur was expecting the worst. But instead, Timur is told what we saw happen. The people of Samarkand had risen up and had defeated the Mughals. Not too long after some of Timur's scouts return and verify this information, the Mughal soldiers are retreating, and they're retreating on foot. Their power has been broken, and our home is free to take back. Hussein also hears this news, and both he and Timur are obviously thrilled, and they immediately send word to one another to make plans to return. And when the two men finally met up again, Yazdi tells us this. They embraced each other, and having renewed their friendship, they promised to be more closely united than ever before. Here they are, the two friends, the two brothers, finally with a bit of luck on their side. So they return to Mawarnar. Timur spends the winter in Kesh, his home city, rebuilding the city, making sure everything is in order for the Barlas people. And then that spring, he links up with Hussein, and the two princes approach the city of Samarkand. And this is where the details on what happens next get a bit fuzzy. The individuals who had led the defense of Samarkand, who were possibly Sarbadars, possibly just prominent leaders, but whoever they were, they had succeeded in uniting their city and their people in defeating the Mughals. 
And thus, they were feeling pretty good about themselves, and I think rightfully so. Not anybody can just do that. But we're told that this is when power went to their heads. And they decided that now that they had this control of the city, why should they give it up? In fact, why shouldn't they enact this power over the people a bit more? And as Yazdi explains, these Sarbadars quickly descended into corruption. They partied all the time, and they used arm ma armed men to extort the people of what little wealth they had left, even using violence and killing to ensure their rule. Now, is this true? Possibly. But there's also a chance that this is later Timurid propaganda, made up later to justify what Timur and Hussein do next. We will likely never know whether or not these leaders were corrupt or to what length this corruption existed, but our chronicles tell us that the people of Samarkand were angered by this corruption and asked Timur and Hussein to free them from this newfound oppression. And so, Timur and Hussein agree to help, being the good guys that they were. And once again, there are a few different theories on what happens next. Timur and Hussein possibly tricked the leaders of the city into meeting up for a talk and then killing them all. Or the two princes enter the city, gathered up all the leaders, held a military trial for them, found them all guilty of corruption, and beheaded all of them. Except for one guy who Timur personally spared. And unfortunately, like so much of Timur's early life, we'll never know just what the details were. Were Hussein and Timur truly doing what they believed was justice in order to protect their people? Possibly. Or were they grabbing power and then justifying their actions decades later with biased retellings? Also possible. But the end result is this. The Sarbadars are killed and the city of Samarkand is restored to the rule of Timur and Hussein. Except that it wasn't. Timur and Hussein didn't rule Samarkand together. Hussein ruled it. It was Hussein's right, after all. And this is where we really begin to see the cracks in the relationship between the two men. Because they came from very different backgrounds and very different understandings. Hussein had always been a prince. He had always had a kingdom, or at least the claims to that kingdom. He was descendant from royalty, royalty that was well-remembered and maybe even well-loved. While Timur... Timur had his claims to the Barlas people in the city of Kesh, and he certainly had become a well-known warrior and maybe even some sort of freedom fighter, but he had no claim to the throne of Amir or Khan of this land. At least not yet. Thus, Hussein became Amir of Mawarnar. And as much as some of our pro-Timur sources want us to believe so, Timur was not co-Amir. He probably wasn't even second in command. He was powerful, for sure, and he had quite the resume at this point, but he was no emir. So as Hussein begins his rule as rightful heir to the western portion of the Chagatai Khanate, things go well at first. Order is restored, courts of law are set up, the borders secured, and trade resumed. But then we're told that things change. They change suddenly, actually. Yazdi tells us, Hussein made known his reigning passions. He saw himself at the height of his desires, and at the same time discovered an insatiable avarice and meanness of spirit. To put it bluntly, Hussein grows overwhelmed with a lust for gold. He starts taxing, taxing everybody, people, merchants, taxed. But then Hussein also begins taxing the different tribal leaders and soldiers of Mawarnar, most of whom had just fought alongside him. In fact, we're told that many of these tribal leaders had lost nearly everything to the Mughals after the defeat at the Battle of the Rains. And now Hussein wants what little they have left. Now, this wasn't the step way. The step way is you reward the warriors who fought with you, not punish them. So, because Hussein does this, it makes a lot of people angry, and several of these men approach Timur with their complaints, and Timur graciously uses his own money to satisfy their debts to Hussein. When this isn't enough, Timur goes to Hussein and implores him, think of the people, think of your soldiers and your allies, stop this absurd taxation. But Hussein refuses. So Timur is forced to continue bailing out many of the other tribal leaders, and at one point it gets so bad that Timur takes the earrings and the necklaces of his wife, the Princess Algi, and takes them to Hussein as payment. Now remember that Algi is Hussein's sister, and Hussein recognizes these pieces of jewelry as the pieces his sister wore during her wedding to Timur, 
but he greedily grabs them nevertheless and immediately sends them off to have their worth discovered. Only when Timur is forced to offer up his own horses does Hussein finally back down a bit and lets Timur keep the horses. Now, you may be thinking what I'm thinking. Did this actually happen, or is this just a later story to portray Hussein in the worst of lights so that his inevitable duel with Timur portrays Timur's actions as justified? And again, as infuriating as it is, we'll never know. Now, our sources do seem to indicate that quite a few tribal leaders were unhappy with Hussein's role, or uh, rule, or role. Or whatever I wrote, it, it doesn't matter. But this isn't surprising. After all, when Amir Kazagan, Hussein's grandfather, when Kazagan had ruled, he was liked by the northern tribes because he stayed out of their way. He stayed in the south. He let them do whatever they wanted for the most part. Hussein isn't doing that. Hussein was present here, up in the north, taxing them, and this does not make him popular among tribes that were fiercely autonomous. Further, Hussein had always been seen as a bit of an outsider here in Mawaranar. Didn't he have his own kingdom down by Kabul? Well, if that's his kingdom, why is he here? He's not really one of us. So I can certainly accept that there would be some discontent here under Hussein's rule. But were Hussein- Who's texting me? I told them to not interrupt me! <sighs> But were Hussein's actions as corrupt and power-hungry as we're told? Probably not, especially in light of how Timur's behavior is described. This is how Yazdi describes Timur at this point in the story. Timur had a sweet temper, a generous soul, noble passions, and every virtue that was necessary to the forming of a great prince. Now, did Timur have incredible leadership attributes? No doubt. But was he a generous soul with a sweet temper? I'd give the mic to our friend Ahmad ibn Arab Shah to answer that one. And this is our big problem with Timur's early life. Very often, our only sources are sources that are blatantly biased in Timur's favor. Thus, of course Timur is only ever portrayed as the virtuous and noble character, while whoever is against him is literally the worst. And even Yazdi admits that Hussein's change in character was abrupt, surprisingly abrupt. And that could be, power does have this nasty way of corrupting people quickly, but also maybe this is just a nice way of justifying what happens later between Timur and Hussein. But regardless of just how things happened, there's no doubt that a huge strain on the friendship between these two men had begun developing. After all, up until this point, they had needed each other to survive, but now, now that wasn't the case. And maybe, maybe Timur never wanted to rule. Maybe he was forced to rule for the good of his people. Or maybe his ambition, all along, was to become a mirror. And now that his friend and brother had this title, Timur had to choose a new plan of action. And as this situation is becoming more and more tense, the politics of the steppe are also changing. Whispers are starting to stir about a possible rebellion. Why should Hussein rule us? Why shouldn't we be allowed to rule ourselves? He's an outsider. He's not from one of our tribes. Maybe we should all rule ourselves. Maybe we should have one of our own rule us. Maybe Timur should rule us. All of these different ideas start stirring up. People begin to talk. Dissent is in the air. And then Hussein gets a letter. A letter that some of his men caught being slipped from one tribal leader to another. And the letter is written by Timur. They open the letter and they find that it is imploring the other tribes to rise up in rebellion against Hussein. Well, Hussein becomes infuriated that his friend and brother would do such a thing and immediately demands that Timur be brought before him. Timur comes willingly, without a fight, and quickly the two talk and discover that this is pretty clearly a fake letter framing Timur. And sure enough, soon thereafter, a few tribal leaders flee Mawarnar just because, you know, we didn't write that letter. No, of course not. We're, we're just deciding to move. So, fancy that. Now, what's interesting is that Timur may have actually been a part of rebellious plots at this time, so the letter might have actually been partially accurate, but whatever the case, this put further stress on the friendship between Timur and Hussein. And then disaster strikes. At some point around this time, possibly a bit earlier, possibly a bit later, but near this point in time, Timur returns home to Kesh one day. And as he's returning, he's met with family and friends who are in mourning. 
his wife, the Princess Algai, sister to Hussein, was dead. Algai had been with Timur and Hussein through it all, near the battles, in the desert, in prison, and often it had been her optimism that had kept the two men going. In fact, there's one story, possibly, well, probably fictitious, but the story goes that back when Timur and Hussein were imprisoned and then finally let out, to add insult to their imprisonment, they were given an old camel and a sick donkey to carry them. Well, the story goes that Algai kept their spirits up and said something along the lines of, Hey, we might be alone in the desert with no friends and riding on these old dying animals, but at least we're not walking. And it was this woman who had been the final glue holding Timur and Hussein together, but with her death, that final adhesive, that last hope for peace was destroyed. Yazdi states, The regard and friendship which the princess had kept up between them was now dissolved. Timur's war against his brother, his friend, and his comrade had begun. Now, it actually wasn't this grand duel between Timur and his allies versus Hussein and his allies, at least not yet. As Beatrice Mann says, this wasn't a duel yet, this was a, quote, more general and recurring pattern. After all, remember, alliances and rivalries were constantly in flux among the steppe peoples of Mawarnar. It's what made these tribes so powerful or so weak, depending on the circumstances. So Timur wasn't the only one opposing Hussein. In fact, he may not even have even been the leader of the opposition. It was likely widespread, disunited, and happening at different times. Nevertheless, Timur was one of the first to gather his forces and declare opposition to the rule of Hussein. Maybe this was an attempt to protect his people from a corrupt leader. Maybe this had always been a part of his plan. Or maybe he was simply taking advantage of the situation, but the rebellion had begun. Timur very quickly secured alliances with two other tribal leaders, a man named Shir Baram Kudalani and another man named Baharam Jalir, both of whom had large contingents of their own. But if Timur had hoped that this three-way alliance would grant him victory over Hussein, he was wrong. Shir Baram Kudalani immediately moved his forces to the mountains and built up fortifications instead of going on the offensive with Timur. And then, after Hussein offered Sherbaram a nice peace deal, Sherbaram quickly changed sides and joined Hussein. Again, the politics of the tribes at this time were fickle. Men acted in what would be the best for their people. As for Timur's other ally, Baram Jalir, he gathered his men, pillaged some of the countryside, took as much gold and slaves as he could, and then he left. He went east to Magulistan and joined with the Mughals, content to have gained enough riches to live comfortably. So Timur is alone. But this is where something very interesting happens. Hussein sends messengers to Timur. They arrive to Timur's camp and give him Hussein's message. And in this message, Hussein implores and begs Timur to see reason. Peace is the best option for all of us. Remember our friendship and our brotherhood. Remember that it was our union that gave us the empire. Remember the desert where we starved together. Remember the battles in which we bled together. Please see reason, my friend. This doesn't have to end this way. And oddly enough, that's it. That's all we're given. Later, Hussein will send Timur another similar message, and it'll turn out to be a trap. But this time, our very pro-Timur sources seem to indicate that this letter was genuine. And instead of Hussein being the one to sour relations even more, it's Timur who does that. In response to this message, Timur spits and exclaims that he trusts the words of the East Wind more than he trusts the words of Hussein. And so in response... Hussein gathers his forces, gathers his allies, many of whom had recently abandoned Timur, and Hussein marches south towards the Iron Gate where Timur is encamped. Then one morning, Timur wakes up to even more bad news. The men of the Yasa'uri are leaving. They've had enough. The Yasa'uri tribe was arguably the closest ally to the Barlas tribe, historically speaking. Uh, this was because they were located nearest to one another geographically, so alliances between the two had been very common. And the Yasa'uri warriors had long been loyal men to Timur, but now, seeing their situation, seeing how hopeless this war was, they left. Better to go home and be ruled by Hussein than to die here under Timur. And so... Late in the year of 1365, we again find Timur in a precarious position. 
His allies have abandoned him, his soldiers are deserting, and he had severed whatever hope was left for a peaceful resolution with his friend and brother, Amir Hussein. The path forward was now clear. It was either Timur or Hussein. There could only be one. As historian and author Justin Morosi ominously puts it, the vast lands of Mawarnar were not big enough to encompass their rival ambitions. This has been the Timur Podcast. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed, a rating or review on whatever listening platform you're using is much appreciated. As always, feel free to reach out to me for any time and for any reason via email at timurpodcast at gmail.com, on Facebook at timurpod, or on Twitter at Podcast Timur. Next week, I hope to have a bit of a longer episode as the struggle between Timur and Hussein goes on for quite a while, and it has some very surprising parts to it. In fact, while I was reading the other day, I came across something that Timur does that made me say something along the lines of, and out loud, come on, man, you've, you've got to be kidding me. So I look forward into diving into that more, and I also want to get back into the hang uh, as much as possible of longer episodes. Around the 40, well, 35 to 45 minute mark would be ideal. We'll see if I can actually obtain that in the near future, but that is what I'm aiming for. Anyway, thank you for listening. Join me next time right here on the Timmer Podcast. Mm-hmm.